to, you know, we as Episcopalians generally believe in baptizing as an infant. But if you were a Baptist, you would baptize when you're uh, a teenager. Mm -hmm. But it's both an entrance right. The difference for us is that um, our parents and godparents make the promises for us. Mm -hmm. But then we confirm that when we are confirmed by the bishop. So that's kind of the, uh, the difference. With Baptists, they make their kind of their own decision that they're being baptized. Uh, and they don't have confirmation. So, but it's, it's kind of how the, the church has mm -hmm. done really the same thing, only different. That is true. Baptism is one of the sacraments or rites, if you don't use the language of sacraments, that all Christian faith share. But it looks different. So one of the, if you didn't hear everything, one of the themes of this dyad over here was entrance right and, and being a part of our community. Any other thoughts that popped up? Again, big tent, so we're not going right and wrong. So, so, something that, that, that occurred to me is that when I was young, baptism was something that was done one family at a time, sort of typically on a Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. but with just the one family, just, just the family, the child, the young child, and, and and members of the family. Whereas now, it's done at the service on Sunday morning. So, so it's an introduction to the community, which is true now and never used to be true at all. That is a very good point, and for those of you who are also Book of Common Prayer nerds, our 1979 Book of Common Prayer, which I absolutely love, is when that changed, at least for the Episcopal Church in the U.S. Um, other other Anglican traditions may have changed at slightly different times, but it moved from being a private ritual to a ritual within the community. Yes. And that's what we were talking about at our table. I just talked about how it was a, a family commitment, but mm -hmm. the rest of the community commitment. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, you're there in front of everyone and everyone in the community. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it is that unfolding, that community, people around you. Well, I was thinking if you remove something from the equation, it's a way to learn about that thing more. So let's say there's somebody that comes along, he believes in God, and he loves his neighbor as himself, but he was never baptized. Mm -hmm. What becomes of him? How important is baptism? Now that is a good question too to raise up, and a question a lot of people have asked. Um, that working with parents and other people who come to baptism, the idea, which I think you're getting to in your question of original sin, is still very alive and well. I will um, state that I don't believe in it, um, that it is not something that forms my theology of baptism, but that is not to say it's not there, it's not a question, it's not a part of people's decisions um, when they... <laughs> Forget the notion of original sin. Doesn't the water and baptism, the need for the water disappear, the washing away of the sin? That's a great question. For me, no. Um, the water in baptism is unifying our our story, Jesus's story, to his birth, death, resurrection, and ascension. Um, I do believe that in baptism, in our vows, we are called. There's one pledge we say that when we turn away from God, we will turn back to God. For me, the act of repentance is a continuation of free orientation to God and God in this world. Um, as, as an imperfect human, I'm very comfortable admitting that there are times when I make bad decisions, that there are times when my decisions are not aligned with what I believe God's will for me is in my life. And by repenting, I turn toward God again. I don't believe, though, that that is... Um, an essential, the, the washing away of sins is a forever thing, if that makes sense. Um, and these are all great questions, so what I'm also going to reiterate again is we have big tent theology here. So it's okay for all of us to have different beliefs on the ritual of baptism. I was born in 1980, so just as a, I'm just saying that because our Book of Common Prayer came out in 1979. I wasn't formed by our previous book of Common Prayer, and that makes my beliefs different than if you were, and I honor that. I mean, there is, there is joy in that, and there is loss in that. So that is one of the questions. You guys all brought up great points. When I sat down in my huff to write this book, and I thought I have to write it in a way that parents can read it to their children, that it can be simple, 
what is the most important thing. And so although we have this big tent, we have a lot of beliefs, we already have great picture books about sin. If that is an important part of your baptism theology, Walter Longman Jr., Water Come Down. It is your book, it is a beautiful book, and I'll recommend it. If it's really community focused, there is a book um, in the ELCA world that I'm forgetting the name of, we have in the bookshop, that's a board book that's all about community. For me, the question was, how do we get the Episcopal service and what we believe? How do we get that core of what we say in our baptism service? And for me, it was a return to our prayer book. I looked at our prayer book and I thought, what do I love to share with people when they're preparing for baptism? And a couple things came out. One is although we often don't agree with our um, partners of faith, with our denominations about the minutia of how we believe, what we do agree on is that it's one faith and one baptism. So those people, the, so other denominations, that's a poor choice of phrase, other denominations may not have the same expression in many ways, but we do share baptism, even if we understand it differently. Another theme that came up is the community, that we are being brought into a community that is meant to support and push us towards God. In our Episcopal service, we are always asked, will these present support this child or this person in their life in Christ? To which the community says we will. That is uniquely and beautifully Episcopalian. And so that essence I wanted to get in. And then the last thing that, um, in, again, a nerdy way, I love our baptismal covenant. Like, if we had to talk about something that I could talk about forever, it's the baptismal covenant. But I'll keep it short. Our baptism is a day forever after, which is the last line of my book, because, yes, we're being invited into community. Yes, we're being invited into this unity. Yes, we're being invited into God's love and Jesus' death, resurrection, um, ministry, and ascension in a different order. Um, but if that doesn't transform us, then what is it about? What is it truly about? And those five questions in the baptismal covenant are what helped me. Um, I realized that I didn't bring books of common prayer, so if you're like, I need to go into that later, I have plenty in my office, there's plenty in the sacristy. But those five questions are the ones that talk about how do we live a life. And that's what the book's text is based on, because they're beautiful for every age that I will seek the holy in everyone I meet, that I will look for Jesus and honor that, that will respect the dignity of every human being, that when we turn away from God into sin, when, not if, because we will, we will turn back to God. So how do we take those questions and change them into words that might be a little accessible, more accessible for our younger audience? So that was the inspiration, and I'm not going to go too much further into that because we still need time for Peter, which I'm going to learn a lot. Um, just an aside, we, as Jim pointed out, um, we do often baptize as children. Um, we see it as a gift from God. All baptisms have holy mystery. We've been trying to understand it with our head, but we're never going to fully reach it. God is the acting agent. We are providing the structure for people to make that decision. If you're an adult and haven't been baptized, I'd love to have a conversation with you too. So that's an offline thing. So I wrote it in a hump. That life happened as it does. Months passed. I'm like, okay, got this written. What do I do? No idea. Um, so I would come to the bookshop and be like, what do I do? What do I do? Um, Cindy eventually gave me Ryan Williams' email address, who is the distributor. He has a, a fancier title than that, but um, he, he provides bookstores with, with their books. And so I emailed him and said, here's my idea. We need a book that has more diversity, that represents God's um, kingdom on earth, and that is Episcopal in nature. And he forwarded that on to Sharon Eli Pearson, who I had met 10 years earlier doing some workshops. Sharon said, you know, that's a great idea. You read Walter Longman Jr.'s Water Come Down. And I said, actually, I'm very familiar with that book. Um, now, because I knew her, I could say pretend you're not white and heterosexual and read it again. And <laughs> I was a little worried about that email because it had a little bit of spice in it. Um, and you know how email can sometimes come off wrong. But she did. 
And she said, okay, I'll sponsor you. Um, here's this form, which ended up being 10 pages. Please fill it out with a book comparison of all that's on the market, um, your ideas, your bio, who the target audience is, an outline of the book. It's a picture book, so dedication, context, and family pages. Um, and send it back in. I did that. This was um, spring, to not this previous spring, but the spring before that did that. And what I didn't realize that was going on in church publishing is they'd only done three picture books before, and they were very particular picture books for a very particular thing. And so by proposing it, what it was throwing them into was a, do we do picture books? We're not sure we do picture books. I don't know if we do picture books type of conversation. So I send this in, and I'm not hearing from them for like a month or so. I'm like, what's going on? Um, in those questions, they kept sending me back requests. So first it was, still loving this idea, but we can't picture it. And you send it out one. It's a picture book. How about I send you the test? Right? I'm having a hard time imagining the outline. And they said, okay. That was probably the scariest moment for me because I had the text. I knew what I wanted to say. And this was the moment in which I knew someone could judge it and say yes or no. Fortunately, they said yes. So then they said, we still, we like it, but we don't like doubt what it's going to look like. Can you send me image um, ideas? So I thought, I don't know, that's kind of why you're getting the illustrator and the artist, but sure, I'll write some things down, um, starting with the core of five families that all look different to represent God's kingdom and kind of putting them in. Sent that in, Sharon said thank you. And then it was about a month and a half. So you know how you have like so much energy at the beginning of the project, you're so excited. Um, and they're like, do do do. So meanwhile, being me, I'm looking at other classes. How do I self-publish this book? How do I do this? I signed up for Springboard for the art classes. I was ready to go. I had my plan B. And then like October 1st, Sharon's like, yeah, we'll do it. I was like, oh. um, there's a bit of a surprise in that. I've kind of given off that hope. And she said, can you have the rest of the text to us in two weeks? Um, and I said, sure. I know this is a first time experience for me. I didn't even know what I'm saying yes to, so why don't we just say yes right now? Um, which was a joy. The book of the text was written, what wasn't written was the letter to the family, in which the theology of baptism is further outlined. Some family practices, um, and, and you can go deeper into those if you want. A quick um, and now I'm going to stop on the process, talk quickly about faith experience because I want Peter to kind of pick up there. Um, one of the questions when you do a project like this is how does it impact your faith? Um, the process that we just did as a group, naming and claiming what we believe, I had to say I'm going to name and claim this belief at this time. And what's scary about that is that it's way more permanent. My faith may change, my understanding may change, as our church's understanding has changed, as you pointed out. But to do this project, I have to be here in this time and say this is what I believe. Um, and that was scary. Versus a sermon which is recorded and then you know, kind of goes off into the ether and, and dies. And things like history. this is a printed thing. Um, the other thing for me was really the wrestling with, is this my call? And we're going to say, for this time it is, but what does that mean? What does it look like? Who are the critics? All of the unhealthy voices that we have and learning how to talk to them. And the third thing for me is there's practices for families in the back, for godparents, for grandparents, for important adults. I kind of love to read those and think about which children in your life or adults you need to support in their baptism, or you can support rather than need to. And as I was writing those, I was thinking about my God, children, uh, my nephew who I baptized a couple years ago, and how do I live these practices? And so one of the things that's so small, and I bring up because I think supporting each other in our faith at times can be so small, is this year he was fortunate with me on his baptism anniversary. I have this awful two-minute video on my phone, which is about as bad a quality as you can have, while still knowing what's going on of him being baptized. And because he was a baby, he doesn't remember it. So we sat, and we watched that video three times. 
And he smiled, and he loved to hear about uh, everything that went on. Then his big sister joined us, and we talked about why she wasn't in the video, because she decided to carry on at that moment, because the focus wasn't on her. It wasn't, it wasn't this big, deep theological moment. It was just a moment in which God was present, and they had experienced and it was a story I could tell them. And that was a holy moment. And those are the moments I'm the most grateful for and how this book has changed my life. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Peter. Um, there were words, and then there were images. Hello. Does it still work? Yes. Right. I'm Peter. <laughs> I did illustrate this book. Um, it was a Saturday in June of 2017. Amy, Ezra, Eleanor, and I were driving to Fargo. I was feeling my phone vibrating, so I was like, "Okay, next stop, I'll check my check what that's about." Uh, we pulled over to Sock Center, uh, birthplace of Sinclair Lewis. We were actually at the Holiday gas station where Main Street hits 94. So pulled over there. Uh, I checked my texts. Uh, Anna said she had a project she wanted me to do, or we, you know, talk about. Let's say she wanted to talk about this project. So like, okay, so the next Sunday, we met her in her office, and she told me all this. I never heard about, you know, I had no idea she had kind of written this book, had this idea. Um, it sounded wonderful, and she said, if they ask me for a recommendation for an illustrator, would you consider doing it? And it was one of those, you know, I said yes. <laughs> but it's one of those, I was, I was just looking up uh, First Samuel with the Here I Am work. Um, there's so few times in your life when you're answering the question and you realize that it's holy ground when you're mm -hmm. saying it. One of those was when Mary Lusk in 2011 said, would you ever think about helping with Sunday school? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here I am. So, would you be interested in this project? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. But then, even besides that, it's like, do you want to illustrate a children's book? It's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, it's like, just childhood dreams. You know, she said, I have this mission in space. Do you want to be an astronaut with me? It's like, yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Well, it's going to be a lot of hard work. We have to go to Washington and learn how to be an astronaut. Yes. Yes, we're doing it. Yes, yes. So, she's talking about the outline. Um, so, I was sent the outline, and this is the text. And then, this is what I had to turn into a picture. So an image of flowing water with lush plants and the water story from Jesus' ministry like Jesus' baptism or woman at the well. So I have to figure out how to make a picture out of that. So I'm, I'm an ex -enial. I'm not Generation X, I'm not a millennial. I draw things on a piece of paper. That's the only way I can start. But then I scan that into the computer and do everything else on the computer. So I'm like right in between the two worlds. So. The very first thing I do is literally take two pieces of paper together, like the two pieces, you know, you're looking at the book, start drawing it. And so this is Jesus and the woman at the well. And as you're sketching, you're kind of thinking, well, how do I put this all together? And this was tough because I started looking at pictures of Jesus and the woman at the well, and every image I looked at looked like Jesus mansplaining how awesome he is. <laughs> <laughs> so this was maybe like draft. <laughs> so this was like the second version. It's like, okay, they have to be equal levels, their eyes are, you know, there's no one higher at the work. She has all the equipment she needs, she's a capable woman, she knows how to get water. <laughs> <laughs> so then I scan that in and I put it in color. So it's like the first version. It looks neat, but this is what I call dollar store illustration. 
when you, you would get a book at a dollar store. It's like, yeah, they, they did it. <laughs> to me, this is missing texture. It's missing all the things that bring it to life. You know, it works, everything's there. It's missing things. So I needed texture, but I needed to do it quick. I didn't have time to paint these. I had three months. <laughs> so it's like, how do I get texture? How do I make meaningful texture? So for about a month, I brought my camera to church. I started taking, and I think we kind of all recognize if we look, ever look down at church, we've seen that. There's some wood from St. Mark's, some other wood textures. That is some stone in St. Mark's. And as I was taking pictures, I was getting closer and closer. This is uh, outside St. Mark's. You can kind of tell it was winter. I don't know why. It kind of looks cold, doesn't it? But I just kept getting closer and closer. And I took this picture, and it's like, well, what do you do with that? And then I saw, well, what is this stuff? That's like decades of, you know, it's built up. You, you get even closer. That's a texture in there. And you get even closer on some things. It's like, wow, look at that. I can't, I can't even remember where at St. Mark's this is, but it, it's here. So, you start putting those textures in, and it's getting fleshed out a little more. And then you start layering those textures, and some of that stuff that's starting to look like water and clouds. I think these dots here, I think that's literally this floor here. Yeah. So that was kind of my process. And then as I was working, I'd have to show everything to Anne. I'm usually at the sketch level. But, um, so here's another illustration. Um, so look at this design on their carpet and the design on their wallpaper. The carpet is behind you, the grating. Um, the wallpaper is actually that, but the carpet out there, but it's turned to yellow. So it, it's very faint, but it's there itself. So it's all that design kind of in yellow. It's actually that carpet. And then, not everything I could just find. So, so I just took paper, paint, just started doing stuff. And I considered everything I made like this also kind of like a fountain of texture. You know, I just sit and do it at the table. I don't think about what I'm doing. I'm just making different marks, patterns. Um, and I scan all those in, and I consider those textures I use also. So this circle ended up being really interesting to me that is, and that became the circle and the handle and the cover. Okay, so in the middle of working on this, the kind of three month run, I turned 40 years old and my choice of what to do to honor that I went to the Grotto of the Redemption in West Bend, Iowa. It was built in. <laughs> I've been there. It's yeah, beautiful. It, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Father Dauberstein, uh, as a young man, this is about 100 years ago, he got pneumonia, almost died. He prayed to Mary, save me from this pneumonia. Well, he was saved from the pneumonia, so he started building her a grotto and just kept going for the rest of his life. It's this whole city block. Um, and it was absolutely beautiful to me, transformative to me. And how should I put this? When I was there, I realized I was crossing the threshold into a new phase in my life. And I love Jim Hike said, baptism is an entrance right. 
because that's exactly what it was to me. I kind of felt like the person I was from about 20 years old to 40 years old, I'm becoming a new person. And so I just love being there. I guess that's me going through the portal and in from the right. It's absolutely beautiful in the snow. So another uh, nice thing about being there, there's all these rocks that Father Daverstein got from all over America. You put them together, I have my camera, I'm working on this one. Here's more textures. So my experience of the grotto, that entrance right, got put into the book also. Um, that's actually looking up, that's like some kind of stalag. Um, and he had mosaic pieces he got from Italy. So those that he that he has all the stations of the cross and kind of like all around him is there these mosaic pieces. Um, and those mosaic pieces it's kind of hard to see. You can see on this page there's kind of yeah. mosaic pieces. So that's that. Um, so yeah, there are images from the grotto in the book. Um, this was my sketch for that page. And I'll go back and show you. There's, there's a difference there, and that's because of Anna. I always, maybe it's because I'm an introvert, I try to do the scene as economically as possible. And I show it to Anna, and she says, I need more people. She needs more community, more relationships. There's always more people, more people. Oop, 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 oop. So, yeah, it's always adding another person, and I'm glad she did that. She, that's the weakness of mine, I guess. It's a uh, being maybe too economical with her relationships. She, she had me add more people every time. And this is, an, this is a perfect illustration of it. So my first conception was the kids coming to church, and there's the priest and the deacon. And then she's like, well, maybe there's an usher greeting them. It's like, okay, I'll put in an usher. Well, maybe there's someone sitting in the pew already, like they're early for church. Okay, so I'll put in a person. Well, maybe someone else is up there, and he's kind of looking through the Book of Common Prayer to like kind of get used to the right. Okay, so he's looking at the book. Well, maybe he's talking to someone. So he's, well, now we have too many grown-ups. Maybe that person can have a kid. So that he says a kid. So what, what, like you know, like I said, my original like an economical vision became this much bigger thing. So I'm putting this. I did not make this. This is a dollar store illustration. There's a, there's a page in the book about turning away from God and turning back to God, and I kind of dreaded doing that because all I could think is these. Christian picture books from when I was a kid I always had this. I am remembering this book about the kid with the baseball hat on sideways in the bat, and he's looking at the broken window in the house, and there's this huge tear coming out of his eye. I remember as a kid, I loathed those pictures. I hate, I just hated them. And here's, here's another one. Yeah, my little talks with Jesus when you make mistakes. And I'm, in analyzing why, why I felt that way, it made me realize that this is what adults think I am. I'm this whimpering little creature that freaks out about stupid stuff. And that my relationship with God can be boiled down to stupid stuff. <laughs> you know, I got this inner life with God. You know, my own sister saying, well, when you break a window, here's here's what to do. It's like, you, you know, you realize they don't get it. So I'm glad I remember that because I didn't want to do this. So then Anna said, well, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> well, that, that page turned into this page. Um, my conception
question was that she was turning away. She was being invited back in. She is still herself, but she gets to come back into the fold. And they're all welcoming her back in. And I tried just, it's so vague and unspecific, but I wanted that feeling in the color and the design, that hot feeling that you know you're angry, but you're happy, but something holy is happening to you. So I think it was pretty successful, at least as far as my idea. And I, this page may be my favorite just for me. I love William Blake, and, and this, is, this looks like William Blake to me. So I was proud of that. And this is the last page. Today is the day forever after. Um, we didn't really have an idea for the last page, but one of the ideas that was floated was maybe a scene in the future where they're looking back on the baptism day. It's like, yeah, that's it. Um, so these are the, the two men on the cover. They have grown old, and their daughter has grown up, and she now has a child. Um, I grew up Catholic, and in many ways I still am Catholic. I will always be Catholic. I had a magical understanding of what communion was, which was when you go to communion, or receive any sacrament, really, uh, time is stopping. You've entered into the space of heaven where time doesn't matter. When you go to communion, it's the same communion that happened a hundred years ago. It's the same communion that will happen a decade from now. It's the forever day. In Hebrew, it's Leolam. In, you know, it's world without end. So I wanted to express something like that. And when you realize they grow older together and life keeps on going, to me that was a day forever after. So, second baptism. Um, and that's the last page. And that's because of all I had to say. So. so I just learned it ton too. So I was, I was actually really looking forward to Peter's part of the presentation because although we were talking during the whole illustration process, I knew there was a lot more going on for him um, that I wasn't hearing. We have a few more minutes. We wanted to make sure we ended in time to see if there are any particular questions, thoughts, whatever, whatever space is paused. Uh, what I would like to say is that I rarely interact with children, so this is my opportunity to interact with children is baptism and Sunday services. Thank you. So I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you owning that. As I said earlier, when we say we will in the baptismal service, that just isn't lurk. That is not just lip service. That is a moment in which we can say we will raise these children up. So thank you. Jim. Uh, I was just going to say that it took me to the last page to realize what was going on. And, and uh, I think that was amazing. And thank you for that. That was incredible. That was um, a part of the story that Peter uh, didn't share. Is So I mentioned like I had to put images to the words. I got to a point where I'm like, I don't even know. I've been looking at this 10-page report for so long that I have no perspective. So like that one, I'm like, I just need to write something down. Um, so when I gave it to him, I said, I wrote this down, this idea, and it's a really bad idea. So I hope that it come counting at a, at a tired time. So I hope you won't listen to it. Um, so I am glad he didn't, and I'm really grateful that this is what Peter came up with, because what I originally wrote was, was a result of sleep deprivation. Uh, <laughs> and this caused me to think what, what the church's ongoing strategies are for teaching children about the meaning of their baptism. They get a little older, mm -hmm. and, and how do you work from you know, what you have here, Mm -hmm. 
sometimes it, you know, that gets lost. We sort of expect them to figure out what the baptism meant without actually communicating that to them in a significant way. I agree. And those are questions that I'm always wrestling with. Always wrestling. How do we live our faith at each point? And how do we as a church provide tools? And so sometimes when I think big picture, I get overwhelmed. So for me, this was a time to say, I believe, I know that picture books are one of the few tools I can send home that don't feel like a burden automatically, that don't need like a 10 page document to say, here's how you use it at home. So this is a small answer to that, but it's a much bigger question that I think the church will call to ask together. Um, some of the, before, before I go too dorky big for me, um, Parents are the main faith formers of their children. That can be a really empowering stat or a really scary stat, depending on how you feel about it. So part of our call as a faith community, and this is a particular faith uh, point in life, is to provide those tools and support. But how to do it is a really big question. And that's not to say we're not supposed to provide tools and support at every stage of life. But when you're talking about that, it's it's one that bounces around in my mind a lot. Not always with the answers, but often with the questions. So thank you. I saw a hand back there. Our seven-year-old granddaughter read the book to me. <laughs> and that made me doubly happy. And I could read, too. I can just imagine those are the moments of, with our families that we're reading. And, and I mean, to get to that point, I'm sure you were with her since she was little. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. Marie. I think I see another book coming. Um, yes, that is the Thinking, oh. Listening to, to Peter and what he was saying about um, Eucharist, communion, and the Lord's Supper. Without saying too much, we're like on the same wavelengths. <laughs> well, if that is all of the questions, I appreciate you all being here. Um, if you have any questions, we have a couple of handouts, if that sort of thing. We have coloring sheets that Peter designed for children. One is the main page, the other I love his daughter Eleanor chose. She's like, this is the page I want to color. And then as a part of preparation, I wrote two gas blog articles. One for building faith is much more like, how can you take baptismal practices home? If there's someone you think would value that, please grab one. The other is for story count. I printed less of those because that was more, one was targeted at parents and families. The other was targeted more at like me and my job. How would I use this book as a tool for formation? So if you want to go deeper, um, there are those resources there. I can speak for myself. Feel free to reach out with questions or reflections afterwards. Um, and um, I feel like I forgot one thing. Oh, and just the, the, the note, if you ever have questions about um, baptism as an adult or teenager, that's also something I love doing. It's so much fun, so please touch base with me and we will we will talk about what that looks like here within our faith community of St. Mark's. You want to add anything? Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all for being here.